thank you, Jessica Ortiz, for the, um, for the introduction. I want to uh, first welcome you all back to Amherst. Uh, I don't know when the last time that you were here, but we're, we're delighted to have you back. Uh, I want also to thank the bookstore that has the books outside, and they are always very supportive of events like this, and Marcus and the folks of communications for uh, being present in the recording this uh, for the larger audience. Uh, let me start by uh, acknowledging uh, what is to me the obvious. I am born and raised in Mexico, and at this point in my life, close to in my mid-50s, have spent roughly half of my life in the south, uh, south of the border, and half of my life uh, in the north. Um, in the period that was close to the 2016 election, there were a number of different statements by then candidate and today's president, uh, Donald Trump, that uh, affected many of us very deeply. Uh, and I count myself in that group. I, uh, I was particularly struck by the rhetoric that he started using on uh, Mexico and Mexicans and on building a wall um, from one end to the other across the US-Mexican uh, frontier border. Um, I had uh, adapted, I had assimilated, I had acculturated into this country uh, for over 25 years, always with the hope that this country would uh, show its best um, its best side, its most empathetic and engaging and humane side uh, to immigrants in general. Not only am I born and raised in Mexico, I am a descendant of Eastern European Jews who arrived to Mexico escaping pogroms and other forms of antisemitism in the 1910s and 1920s. And so I became an immigrant and I am an immigrant myself in the, and in the DNA of the family the the need to uh, pick up your luggage, uh, whatever you have, and move to, move to another place has been a constant motive uh, for several generations. Uh, I am the one that broke that pa the pattern of stability uh, in that my parents and all of their uh, siblings uh, and cousins uh, stayed in Mexico and made a life there. I moved north, hoping to find, as I was mentioning, a space where I could uh, relate to other immigrants and have and find a voice. For me, that was crucial. Uh, I arrived in, to, in the United States with very little English. And the idea of entering the melting pot and becoming part of the large, larger mosaic entailed teaching myself as, a, as best as I could the English language and thus not become a pariah in, in this country. And those were the first periods, the first years of my, of my immigration to uh, the United States, particularly to New York City. Uh, I, was ho I was helped by an enormous amount of kind people when I first arrived, uh, people that uh, became teachers, people that became friends, and people that uh, taught me uh, what it means to be part of this country and how one is never the last immigrant. Uh, it, one is always part of a long ch uh, uh, chain uh, before and after, and uh, we must always look at the past as well as to the future. To me, what uh, Donald Trump did at that point, in particular that statement about bad hombres and the idea that all Mexicans are criminals, uh, rapists, uh, touched me very deeply, and it touched me anatomically. It felt as if he was not only talking about uh, a almost 2,000 mile uh, wall that he would build, but he was talking about uh, a kind of incision that, that would be 
created in my in my own body uh, there was there's a part of me that uh, though i have become a full-fledged passport carrying american has refused to cut ties with my country and with the country of my birth and that uh, need has passed on to my children and to the, uh, some of my students and so this idea of a uh, 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 a big barrier separating the two countries um, almost uh, took over me in suffocating ways. And I say so because it wasn't uh, the, 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 the possibility of tuning off that could allow me to leave that state of mind, but uh, a irrigation that went into my dreams, a state of anxiety, a fear for many of the people that live in, in my immediate community. Um, I don't know how much you know, but not only do colleges uh, sustain themselves over this many years, however many you have, you have been here as students and now returning as alums, but uh, Amherst, the town, has been home to a, an El Salvadorian community for the last 20 or 30 years a, that is a thriving, a very devoted to the place. A, it is present in all walks of life. And a, many of us interact with that community on a constant, a, in, in a constant way, a, in, in sometimes as, a, as acquaintances, sometimes as, a, as workers, sometimes as students. But within the classroom as well, many of us have uh, pushed the college to open its doors uh, to undocumented students. This is uh, maybe 10 or 15 years. And the result is that in the past three, four, five years, the number of, document on, of undocumented students has increased very happily. Um, but uh, given the current atmosphere, it has also created an atmosphere of fear, um, of uh, hesitation, that uh, to me uh, recalls the experience of crypto-Jews during the Inquisition in Spain before and after 1492. They too needed to hide their identity, they too needed to uh, show in public a version of themselves that would enable them to either stay on or choose a particular path for, for them and their families and keep an, another type of identity hidden away from the inquisitors and that carried on again for generations. Many of the DACA uh, students or of the DACA individuals that live in this town uh, want to be known as DACA, uh, that is uh, undocumented uh, individuals who have been here for a variety of reasons and, uh, and uh, they, they want to acknowledge and be and are very grateful to those that have helped them, but they know that their time here uh, really is limited unless something happens. Um, all this to tell you that in that state of anxiety, in that state of, a, of, of fear for those around me, and in that state of a, of of almost obligation of uh, realizing that I had gained a voice over the last 25 years that needed to be uh, used publicly. I uh, took a trip to the US-Mexican border and literally traversed it from one end, the Gulf of Mexico, to the very other end, uh, renting or buying cars on buses, uh, sometimes uh, staying with friends in hotels, in whatever way I could. And the purpose was to smell, to touch, to feel, 
to encounter the communities that live on both sides and to register their own impressions of the border. This is the right moment for me to tell you I am an advocate uh, for borders. I believe that countries need to define themselves, uh, their perimeters, uh, where they start and where they end. Uh, borders have served a purpose for centuries and will continue to serve a purpose. That from there to creating a region where instead of a welcoming hand, you have dogs or helicopters or guns and you are treated in a subhuman way is there's a big gap. And so what I experienced during those those very intense days it left a very deep impression and I came back and wondered what to do with it. I wondered if to, I am by, by by inclination, an essayist and or a short story writer. Uh, I on occasion write also for a uh, theater and for the movies. And I thought that this could become uh, any one of those different uh, genres. Uh, I started with the idea that it could be an essay, a long autobiographical meditation, and it just didn't feel right. And then I switched to theater, and I felt that there was a fragmented aspect of my vision that needed to crystallize on stage only after I brought it to fruition in other ways. And then something occurred to me, and that was that it should be poetry. Uh, I ended up uh, writing a book-long poem. Uh, it's called The Wall, from which I'm going to read to you. And I just want to tell you one or two things before I do uh, a few of the, I, I read to you uh, a few of the sections. I have have not considered myself a poet, uh, though occasionally, at different moments in life, I have written poems. Mostly, though, <coughs> I have been a translator of poetry, uh, a translator of uh, several major Latin American figures, like uh, Pablo Neruda. Uh, I have I translated many of his of his odes, uh, his sonnets. Uh, his free verse poems. I've translated uh, Octavio Paz and Jorge Luis Borges, all of them from the Spanish, uh, and colonial period poets as well, including a famous nun of the 17th century, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. The translator always leaves behind the poem, underneath, in between the words. It doesn't take control of the wheel. Somebody else is in the pilot seat, and as a translator, you hope to bring what that pilot has delivered in his or her original language into the language to which you are translating. I have translated from Spanish into English, and I have also translated from English into Spanish some American poets like uh, Emily Dickinson and Elizabeth Bishop and our own Richard Wilbur. And I have translated from other languages, from Yiddish to Hebrew and from uh, Spanish to Hebrew. Uh, and the experience of translating from other languages uh, is equally exciting to me. I love to see how a poem uh, though I have not only been a translator of poetry, how a poem takes shape in a language that, uh, to which I am bringing the original. And I am very aware of the fact that uh, the translator is also a creator, that the, the translator cre uh, reinvents the poem in the, in the language, because you, are, you cannot do a literal translation. You have to... Uh, improvise, and you have to manage a, a, an artistic side that will allow that poem to exist in that target language. But I had never been a poet, and yet I felt that this was nothing but poetry. I, I had one vision in my mind, in particular, and that was Spoon River Anthology, uh, 
extraordinary uh, volume of uh, poetry where a number of different voices in a symphonic way are interacting. And so what uh, I'm going to read to you is uh, this different versions of the poem that have resonances uh, that come from a variety of Spanish and English and sometimes Arabic and Latin and Greek and Hebrew um, uh, poets that all have descended on my own page. One more thing before I, I do the reading, and then maybe we can open this to a conversation. Um, I, as I traversed the US-Mexican border and talked to uh, Minutemen, talked to uh, people literally jumping the border and running away, talked to some of the, 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 the neighbors that live on the border itself, uh, I was reminded constantly of uh, the very different borders that have defined my own life. I lived for a period of time in Jerusalem, and the border that separates uh, Israelis and Palestinians is just as painful to me as the border that separates Mexicans and Americans. Uh, because I descend uh, from Eastern European Yiddish-speaking Jews, and in particular of Holocaust survivors, that some of whom lived in the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, the walls of the Warsaw Ghetto are, have also played a role in my upbringing. The one particular relative who often talked about how the Warsaw Ghetto uh, individuals related to one another and how they exchange items with non-Jews on the other side of the walls. Uh, I have been fascinated by the Great Wall of China, the purpose, its purpose, um, it, the way it has been turned into a tourist site, so to speak. And finally, there is a very important wall in the history of my own family. I have a younger brother who is about one and a half years uh, my junior. And uh, we used to, you will hear it in the book, we used to have a room together when we were very little and we were very close to one another. And at one point, um, there, there were some tensions between the two of us. And in, in that room that we had, uh, we opted to ask our parents to build a wall and one of us would live on one side and the other one would live on the other side. And I remember perfectly how uh, at first my parents hesitated uh, the, to, to, to do this. It was a very, it was an oblong uh, room that we, in which we could run back and forth and do all sorts of things on the floor and on the walls and uh, it, it, total freedom existed for us there. But, uh, but when my, fa my parents uh, conceded that it was time to, for each of us to have their own, our own individuality, that a, a bricklayer uh, came and started putting, a construction man put the bricks with the cement, and, um, and that was a, a, a moment that I didn't pay much attention to when I was little, and only later has acquired uh, enormous symbolism. The book is divided into four sections. The first section is called The Edge of the Kingdom. I'm going to start there, and then I'm going to read from the second section about which I'll tell you at that point. Let me just get some water. Doleful, confine, incision of despair, margin, precipice, limbo, you slash the body into bulges and puncture the soul. Shipwrecked in a disconsolate country, in a century built through resentment, for six days, Isus Noches, I alone, unencumbered, traverse the land, like Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, in search of ghosts, the mother whose love for her son has soured, the adopted child in search of Genesis, the brother with a heart condition looking for a doctor to cure him. I am an abstraction, my imagination 
free, scans the emotional landscape. Places are sites where fantasy meets recognition. Reality is such an aberration, it is okay to go crazy. Nihil humanum ame alienum puto. But humans are aliens to themselves. The happy socialize with the happy, the powerful with the powerful. And far behind, in a ghetto, is poverty and misfortune. I survey the order to build a cartography of what was and will be. Today gives place to the past as the future is born. Maps, Joseph Conrad said, were blank spaces that became places of darkness. Maps are traps. The true world is outside, beyond, uncontained. Yo soy el mapa de mí mismo. A tumultuous wall keeps them asunder. I start at the start, in the unbridled clash of rivalries, howls and roars and whines and hollers I come across on the beach in Baghdad, Tamaulipas, where caravans of camels carried south during the American Civil War, a town that ceased to exist in 1880. The food plains remain, but not the dreams. Yo solo, sin alma, surrounded by unexpected calm. Where is the fury I see on television? Where are the ill-disposed neighbors? It all starts for me in a never-ending room, its boundaries as far as the eye can see. This is our playground. Day in and day out, my brother and I, ages five and seven, run around back and forth once upon a noontime dreary, incessantly without stop, until we are comfortably numb. Three cold white walls on which we are invited to draw with crayons, markers, paintbrushes. The wooden floor is ideal for sledding. The fourth wall is made of windows. We are inside a fishbowl. Bikes, football, grand guignol. Joy is ignorance, ignorance is bliss. But to moody teenagers, a few years later, the same room look small, compressed, unprivate. Mine is mine, not yours. Rough are the rival sides of siblings, of sibling love. Family relations are a web of conflicted loyalties. Ask Regan, Goneril, and Cordelia. They know each other half as well as they should have. And say, Bilbo, I like less than half of you, half as well as you deserve. My brother, or is it me, soon requests a room change from the adults. Build a brick wall in between, a marker, a border. The command is made. Create two rooms, separate but equal, one for each sibling, ich und du, with two doors, two desks, two closets, two twos. Mother complies, but only after telling a Kafkaesque story, Kafka, patron saint of negation. The man from the country comes before a wall, she says, a wall that is at the edge of the kingdom. Next to the door is a gatekeeper. Can I get out, asks the man. Out, wonders the gatekeeper. You mean in? No, responds the man, out of the kingdom. The gatekeeper laughs. The kingdom starts on the other side, but that side is not for you, at least not now. You must earn your place in it. How, asks the man? By always staying on this side, answers the gatekeeper. In a 2008 navy blue Toyota that burps every time I break, I make my way to narrow-minded Matamoros, Mata, Moros, and near an OXXO, I hear a gunshot, and poof, 
but I see a bloody corpse covered in plastic. It has been there a couple of hours, I am told. Just a couple of hours. She is youngish, and so are the onlookers, except me. No, no one does a thing. No, including me, the ubiquity of death. I am told there are other bodies around. They have already been taken away. Death is quickly taken away. Nobody can see it. A couple nearby kisses and a boy sucks his lollipop. Uy! A mustacho policeman says to me, Ni se acerque, señor. It will be cleaned up shortly. It's much worse in Reynosa. Ask people to tell you about the pool of tears in the cathedral. The policeman talks more through not the kind of talk that fosters congruence. My mother orders the brick wall built, dividing east from west. My room for him, my brother's room not for me. Lo not, not for me, no longer one single boundless room. Alto, my brother and I grow up. As adults, we are selfish, venal, even mercenary, suspicious of one another. Suspicion becomes wariness, skepticism, mistrust. Paradise is now made of halves, two doors, two desks, two twos. I am now going to read from part two. It's called Who, this part is called Who, Who's the Who. Atención, pero nadie te oye. America is home to romantics. All are busy at work, incessant, industrious, back and forth, coming and going. Cigarettes are built by deranged architects at astonishing speed. The skyline changes every second. Nothing lasts a day. Cities rise and fall. The tyranny of the new. New is young. Young is original. Original is novel. Novel is fresh. Fresh is different. Different is desirable. Each wall is made of bricks, cement, beams, plaster. Yet walls alone, disengaged, don't result in anything. But in walls, alone, disengaged, and nothing. Excess, more is more. The future is a work in progress. It isn't now, but across the line, mañana, a promise delayed. Muro de mierda, the ghost of my brother Acuestas. I've walked most of it along zigzagging miles through the coagulum of, gang of the gangrene river, fetid, ghoulish, its perimeter renouncing life. Other worlds are sheer preparation for this. This is the world to end all worlds. No other imaginary line in the world is crossed more frequently. No other line in the planet smells as fetid. See, si, Patron, this the end of my south, and this the end of your north. Just move, go, 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 go. In motion, go, go, through the motions, go. No, no speaking less. Just pretend, amigo. Over there, not everyone speaks the language either. Gracias, gringrito. I love you more than you'll ever know. Puta madre. El camino del diablo. The road where the devil tallies. See them. Thousands of crucifixes irrigate the land. Souls, yours, mine, lying underneath. A final pose, a waiting resurrection, a chorus of laments, murmurs, laughter. These are the soul of brave women and men who struggled here. They have consecrated this unfertile ground above and beyond our poor to add or detract. Death is unfinished work, and it is left to us, witnesses, to their dismay, to do the unfinished work they so nobly advanced, to bring food to our tables, to make us believe we are free, to allow us to dream the dream of being a nation. A nation without a backbone? No, eradicate their memory, cut them out, 
use them, abuse them, ignore their plight, build a wall higher, stronger, mightier. Don't you see it? It isn't steep enough, tough enough, firm enough. It isn't bloody enough. For we have decided to stick to hate. Love is too great a burden to fear. Far stronger than love is hate. All together now, we will build a huge wall, a beautiful wall, and you, you, you will pay for it. A wall from sea to shining sea through the 1,959 miles of my mainland plus 18 more marit maritime miles in the Pacific and 12 in the Gulf. A wall to leave out bad hombres. El Presidente. The founding fathers are rolling in their graves. The Chinese Emperor Shi Wan Ti, also known as Qin Shi Huang, who in 221 BCE built the original Great Wall of China, hated his mother. Such was his abhorrence that he decided to forever erase her memory. But how does one expurgate memory? By destroying its foundations. Those, Shi Wan Ti ordered the burning of all books in the kingdom. History starts here, he said. History starts now. Shi Wan Ti erected the Great Wall to defend the kingdom from its enemies. But the wall brought along a collateral problem, isolating China from its neighbors. Later on, the length of the Great Wall during the, Ma the Ming Dynasty was 5,500 5, 500,003 miles from Hushan in Liaoning to Yiwasan Pass in Gensu. Bigger, faster, smarter, heftier, richer. Be a tourist, take a tour, climb its steep staircases and dwindling vertebrae. The wall is a tourist attraction now. Money, happiness, selfies. Yet it remains a carcass the skeleton of false aspirations. Sherwood Anderson, creator of Winnesburg, where clocks never hurry, answers, yes, true. Women and men lead their lives behind a wall of misunderstanding, a wall they themselves built, and most women and men die in silence and unnoticed behind that wall. He is right on the mark. But once in a while, someone cut off from the rest by the peculiarities of nature becomes absorbed in doing something that is personal, useful, and beautiful. Word of such activities is carried over the wall that someone might be green, that someone might be green, blue, yellow, and brown, that someone is a hero. Isaac's father is taking him to the top. The fence is called Moriah. Call it Teram Visionis, or Marwa, where is the Mecca, or call it Reja de Satanás, where a sign reads, Más sabe el diablo por viejo que por diablo. How easy it is to judge wrongly after what good comes from judging rightly? Where are we going, the boy asks. The Lord has announced to me this road, the father responds. He wants our deliverance. We shall offer him a sacrifice. A lamb will satisfy him. Isaac, a seven-year-old, smiles. Father and son climb at night. The desert is never still. If you're quiet, you might hear the wind. If you're alert, you might see the moon's dress in all its splendors. Once you're at the top, I'll hold you tight, me oyes, orders the father. Where's the artificial lamb? The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. The lamb waits for us at the top. No guards. The father pulls his son, Isaac. Once at the top, the father takes a screwdriver 
out of his leather jacket. It will help loosen the fence. The moon glitters, its reflection multiplied on apathetic steel. The father's, the father's left hand chokes the sun. No puedo respirar, apa. I can't breathe. As the right hand descends, turning the fatal screwdriver into a rigorous weapon. Stop! A sniper, father, Isaac's father falls, lifeless to the ground. The boy shrieks. The border patrol asks the boy to climb down. Down! Abajo! Down, down, down! Where's the sacrificial lamb? inquires Isaac. No, the questions are, who is the angel of death? And where is the angel of life? Who saved Isaac? And from what? Or better, did anyone remember to save the child? Blood spills on the ground, a stream from the father's chest onto the cold cement. Isaac places his fingers in it, hot, cold. I am brown, the color of bronze. Coffee, mud, bigger. Look at me. I am the bricklayer, the organ grinder, the glass blower, the milkman. De este lado también tenemos sueños. It is by accident that we were born on this side and not on the other. The setas are in recruitment mo mode. Beware of the halcones. They spy on you. Either you are in or you are dead. Careful what you wish, cuate. Tomorrow you might find yourself on the other side. Thank you. Sure. You're clearly multicultural and multilingual. How much time did you spend thinking about what language you would express your thoughts in? <laughs> um, I don't spend much time thinking of what language uh, I will express my thoughts. I think that language, the, the different languages dictate to me uh, what will be expressed in them. And I would, oh, I would add to that that often uh, it is because of a target reader that I have in mind that a particular text will, will acquire a certain language and a certain form. In this case, these thoughts and these ideas came to you in English. Came to me in English, but came to me, uh, I'm going to use the word polluted or contaminated or maybe enriched uh, by the mixing of languages that I heard all along in the U.S.-Mexican border where English is never pure, and neither is Spanish. Well, I think that's an interesting idea. You know, that's, that's very interesting. I don't know if anybody else wants to ask. Sure. Well, this is kind of related. Uh, there are places in the poem where I think you're referring to other literary works or intertextual references. And of course, strange fragments or parts of the poem we don't know, but are there other works in particular that you try to kind of play off of a little bit that is a sort of a, a certain pantheon of works or is it just whatever happens to work in a passage? I was, no, I was very conscious of um, having a tradition of sermons and uh, political speeches, uh, both delivered by American presidents, uh, sometimes in campaigns or in the Gettysburg Address, for instance, uh, and by Mexican presidents at different, in different occasions as well. For instance, when signing the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848 that sold what is today the Southwest to the United States. And as I was writing, I felt that these voices were uh, competing for space in wanting to be reflected, but not in a quoted fashion, but more in a subtle, discreet, uh, I would say, peripheral form, and I allowed them in. My, my, my entire experience uh, as a result was one of hearing the poem being dictated to me 
more than writing the poem itself. Um, I felt that I, I literally wrote it in about a, a week and a half, sent it to a number of different friends for comments, to editors where different uh, of magazines where different sections appeared. Um, but unlike an essay where I would struggle with certain parts or a field that I would be digging in order to fine tune a certain idea, I had the impression that I was a, a kind of conductor of, a, of, a, of an orchestra in the different instruments were begging to be heard. Sure. I, I must say the image that is the most interesting to me is the first image of building the wall in your room, which I can understand as a desire to have separate rooms and separate lives at that time, but it is a bizarre image also. And my two questions are, did anyone else, did your friends know that you had built a wall in the room? And have you ever, did you ever revisit the wall in any way with your brother? Sure. Like, I, those what are, was that all about? Sure. That, those are two very important uh, questions, as I hope to be able to convey in my answer. Um, my parents, I have revisited the wall by going back a number of times to that house that is no longer part of the family um, and that was sold but we have visited once or twice when I was when I took my kids to Mexico and my wife and even before it was sold to see it if you uh, are in that room you would not notice that that wall uh, was at any point not there it is uh, an essential part of the house it divides two rooms in those two rooms have the consistency of uh, two rooms. It's hard to, unless you know the history of the house, it's hard to see because them. The wall went from wall, from ceiling to floor. Yeah, imagine, uh, imagine that this was my room and yeah. my brother's, and at one point, uh, both of us, uh, or probably me, thought it would be better that each of us would have their own private life and we asked my mother and she said they, my parents had built a house she said she was reluctant at first but then she said well it was time to build this wall in between and it's a wall that went from from floor to ceiling well, it went to the full from it to ceiling went to two rooms. it's totally two it rooms level, no 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 totally two rooms else. totally two rooms and um, and she told me many years later that the the original room had been planned as a place of play, and that it, it it was considered that later on there would be a wall in between. But this wall became an injury in the relationship that I have with my brother. We were very close when we were little. Um, when we entered adolescence, we started gearing in different directions. Um, and uh, to this day, our relationship is strained. I would not say that it was the wall that separated us, but I would say that the wall is a symbol of the separation. Uh, we took very different paths. We, I have a sister with whom I communicate a lot, but not that much with my brother. Um, and so the wall to me has become uh, a kind of wound or scar of the relationship that I ended up having with him. I would tell you that I built my own personality, as, as siblings often do, a, in a way that was not him. And probably he would tell you the same thing. He is he because he, did, he, he didn't want to be me. Um, but that took us very far. And the result is that that wall to me is um, an emblem of separation. A, that that has had repercussions to, to this day. The gentleman behind. I know it's unfair to ask a poet to explain his work, so I apologize in advance. I'm confused about the reference to the Akeda. Um, generally, Moses, not Moses, Abraham, apologies, is going to sacrifice Isaac because of his 
faith and belief in God. The father in this in, in your poem, I'm trying to understand his motivation for why he's taking out the screwdriver, as you say, to strike his son before he's hit by the um, soldiers or the whoever it is gun. I mean, yeah. I'm trying to understand the motivation of the father at that point. Um, just as, as you uh, are uncomfortable asking the question for a poet to to, to <laughs> describe his his work, um, I I also resist the temptation. Uh, but I will tell you the, the thought that crossed my mind. Um, the imagery of the Bible has, uh, I grew up with it, um, not in a religious way, but in a storytelling kind of a cultural way. Uh, stories of the Bible from Adam and Eve to the, the, the slavery in Egypt, um, the, the Jacob's Ladder, and the Akeda story were recurrent uh, tales told by parents or grandparents or teachers. And it has always struck me, and I teach this often, I teach a course called Love. It's a history of love in various civilizations. And uh, we go through varieties of love. Uh, Self-love, romantic love, love of family, friendship, love of country, love of nature, and love of God. Uh, and when we reach the point of the love of family, I use uh, three different texts from different, three different cultures. And one of them is this one. What kind of father will take his son uh, and lie to him, knowing that it is the son that is going to be sacrificed? Now, it's very important to think of the conflicting emotions that are taking place here. The father, Abraham, wants to prove his devotion to this God who is asking him to lead a new nation in asking him to have a, an unreserved and univocal love for him and not for a plurality of deities that other peoples have at that time. But this comes against the idea of killing his son, his only son, and one that he had very late in life, uh, and he desperately wanted. So the image couldn't be more powerful. When I was walking through, not too far from Laredo, um, I, I heard the story of a father who had taken his son from Honduras, in Central America, all through Guatemala to Mexico with the son, a seven-year-old, next to him with a promise that they were going to be on the other side and they were going to find a family. And the son kept, according to the, the storytellers, kept on asking all these different questions. Why are we going? Why are we leaving the mother and the rest of the family? Is this the right thing? But always from a seven-year-old uh, perspective. In the story, as it was conveyed to me, was that the father climbed the wall with the son, telling him some sort of lie. And when he reached the very top, he had a screwdriver that was going to be able to bring down a fence that would enable him to pull his son on the other side when he was shot uh, by either a Minuteman or a guard. And it was the son who saw the blood spilling of the father and still was wondering what type of story uh, he was going to be able to see on the other side. And the image that kept on coming to my mind was the Akeda story. And the name, I don't know the name of the real father and of the real son, but I thought this had to be Isaac. There had to be some sort of continuity between the biblical story and what I was seeing there. And so I reimagined the story in my head I'm not interpreting it to you, for you because the story later on acquires different echoes, 
But uh, the resonance from my own childhood in that clash of emotions with what this father must have promised to his son uh, that would be on the other side, because that's what the wall is always about, what there is going to be on the other side, uh, was, was at once excruciating and a continuity across centuries. It's very difficult to say. I think we're all shaped by minute details eh, about which we might be conscious or not. I, I didn't think that much about that wall for many years. Um, the strange relationship that I have with my brother has gone through ups and downs. Eh, and only when Trump emphasized the, the border and the fact that it was going to be paid by Mexicans, did the wall in my room come back to my, to my mind? Um, other ideas came to mind as well. Uh, ideas that are rooted in memory and ideas that are uh, part of one's imagination. But uh, maybe I, I'll conclude this question, this answer by telling you that I, I think that uh, what, what strikes me is the way what happens in the public sphere um, has, can have an impact on the unconscious and on the way words will spill out and try to organize and make sense of the world um, and how we are not in control of them. I, I, my, my desire to go to that wall and to feel it, to touch it, to smell it, to talk to people, was absolutely instinctual. And I'm a very rational man that processes things, but I felt that I had to go there before that wall, there are sections that had already been built, before that whole wall was finished, and because I felt that I had, there was an obligation to bear witness to this wall that was connected with my own individual history, with my family history, with the history of the two countries in which I've been a part, a, a member of, and longer a, unexplained dreams and stories that have circulated in my mind. Maybe one last one, sure. You say you uh, accept boundaries but not walls. What's the difference? I think that I, I have gone to the U.S.-Canada border. It's a boundary. Um, it's clear where Canada ends and, and the United States begins. Sometimes and sometimes it's not. Um, it's very easy to go back and forth. If you have, it, it's, not very, it's not very frequented. It's, you, certain parts, you will, you will be the only one crossing it. You can almost sleep on the streets. That doesn't happen in the crucial passing points in the U.S.-Mexican border. This is a militarized zone. Um, so uh, for me, there's a very clear difference between establishing where you end and where I begin and building a fence to say this is me and not you uh, or this is you and not me. Um, the relationship between Mexico and the United States has never really been easy. No two countries can be more different. I, in my view, the United States and Canada share a lot to the degree that you could almost confuse them. And there is a, maybe a, a kind of relaxed approach by Canadians and almost an inferiority complex too, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the United States. Uh, the border with Mexico is the border with an entirely different civilization that goes from Mexico to the Pampas in Argentina. That uh, in the minds of the United States, depending on who you ask, it could be a backyard or it could be uh, an equal. 
um, there is a lot of racism that moves in one direction, a, a lot of paternalism, a lot of uh, unequal emotions, a servitude. Um, and at a time when populism is on the rise and when um, it's, it's easier to isolate ourselves than to, the, than to create connections with others, th th that border has been exacerbated in dramatic, I would say, tragic ways. It strikes me, maybe I'll, I'll conclude with this, that, uh, and I have written a piece for the New York Times about this, it strikes me that we have in the Washington Mall a, a Holocaust museum. And this is my history too. And we have the history of the Middle Passage and slavery also represented there. And Native Americans, a, also a museum for that. A, I, there is no, Latinos represent right now one fifth of the entire US population. The amount of people that have died crossing the border is astonishing. And there is no memorial for them. The memorials that are on this side, the crosses made of woods, are often, often disappear with the elements. There is no brick and stone or, or, or a construction that bears witness to their passage. But the other immigrants have been, have, have had their their memory reflected. It will not happen until and unless more Latinos enter the middle class, more Latinos acqu acquire power the way Jews acquire, or Irish acquire, or, or the Germans acquire power. Um, but for now, their names are not remembered the way we can remember those that died on September 11 or those that died during the Holocaust. And I think that that is a, a uh, a mistake that needs to be corrected. Thank you very much.